No, 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 no. No assistance. There's no external assistance at all. That's not allowed. That's cheating. What if I got a tattoo and it said lead on 763? <laughs> We're going to play a game called fair and square or cheater there. And like, if he's friendly with me, I, I just don't, I mean, yo, you stole money from my friend. Go fuck yourself. A lot of these responses, I'm looking at them. You guys clearly have no fucking idea how hard poker is. Use a HUD. I, I use a HUD. I, I'm not saying it's cheating to use a HUD. It's not. And like you I heard say. it here first, guys, on the Doug Polk podcast. No, I'm just kidding. What's up guys, Doug Polk here and welcome back for another episode of the Doug Polk Podcast. Today we are joined by Olivier Bousquet to discuss cheating in poker, where is the line? We're gonna be talking most specifically about online tools people can use, so things like preflop charts and RTA and HUDs and hand histories, it all makes the cuts. It all makes the cut today, so if you wanna hear that, stay tuned, it should be a great one. But before we jump into that, I wanna quickly talk about a couple items. First off, the podcast is now available on all the major podcast platforms. So if you want to make sure you do not miss an episode and you get these right as they go live, make sure to subscribe over on iTunes, over on Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Head over there, the Doug Polk Podcast. Make sure to subscribe so you won't miss any of the talks that we have. Also, I wanted to quickly say today, if you're interested in learning more about poker and you're not too sure where to start, well, head on over to upsyncpoker.com and check out our free preflop charts. Hmm. Maybe this was the wrong pod for that plug. Moving on, I want to say a few things before Olivier joins. I want to talk about preflop charts in general and, and my thoughts. For starters, anytime you have a solution that you're using to play, I do think that's against the spirit of the game. Part of me feels like it should be okay moving forward because in the past it was allowed. Sites, specifically in their terms of service, allowed preflop charts. I used preflop charts for the majority of my career. And so it feels a little bit bad saying, no, let's not have them moving forward. Like I did something wrong by having them. And I don't think that those two things are mutually inclusive. I think that it can have been fine for me to use them at the time, but also fine for us to say that we're not cool with them moving forward. The logic is that the site's terms of service are the most important thing, and those terms of service uh, agreements have become increasingly aggressive over the last five years. And that makes sense to me. You want to protect the game. You want to make sure that it's safe for people to play. Back in the day, it was less like that. The rules were much more ambiguous in terms of what you could use, and a lot of the rules actually just said that preflop charts were fine. I do think that there's a bit of a difference though. The preflop charts that I was using back in the day were things that I just came up with, stuff that I made up, stuff I thought made sense. I, I had to you know, bust out some spreadsheets and look at some poker tracker hands and, and decide which hand should be in it, which hand should not be in it. Not many hands were mixed action. It was either call or three bet or fold. There was no three betting at 18% or things like that. It was all much more black and white and more importantly, much less strong. And I think that's the issue that people have today and that makes them so much worse is that when you get an output that says the answer is 36% three bet and someone three bets you 36% of the time with a given hand, then they're getting a, a substantial edge over your preflop by, by taking that action. There are some arguments on both sides. You might also argue that the more important edge is how you play those hands post-flop, and that's certainly true. You might also argue that if everyone has these things available to them, then it's not unfair for one player to have that, and I think that's fine. In fact, I think about my challenge with Negreanu. We both had pre-flop charts and agreed to them. Obviously, that's fine if both players agree. What we're really talking is where should we set the baseline for what people can expect when they play, and what should the standards be within the terms of service, and kind of as a community as a whole. At the end of the day, what's most important is that we set rules that we can follow and, and, and know what they are and prevent cheating in the game. I've, for a very long time in my career, tried to do my best to prevent cheating, to out cheaters, to talk about integrity, to talk about doing the right thing, to do the right thing, I would hope. And so I think when this subject comes up, it's important that we're gonna stand as a group against people that wanna take unethical actions to make money at the expense of other players. But I also think that it's important for us to find rule sets that aren't so cumbersome that they're unenforceable and also maybe even bordering on just simply too much. There are points where you have to step back and ask yourself, are we fighting the right battle here? For example, and this is something I bring up in the podcast, if a recreational player has a sheet of what hand beats what hand, well, technically that's external, something external telling you what to do in some capacity. Are we okay with that? Seems completely fine, right? Well, 
Well, what about someone that has an exact breakdown of what ra their range should be post-flop or an exact action they should take post-flop? That's clearly not fine. A computer is telling you exactly what to do. So there's obviously going to be some, some clear-cut examples, but what you're going to find, I think, from this conversation is that there are a lot of spots that it's not clear. It is gray. It's, it's not necessarily this specific thing should or shouldn't be against terms of service per se, but rather it's a site-by-site -site basis. My conversation with Olivier, I think, helped me understand what kind of the other side is to some of these arguments about preflop charts and, and where we want to set the line. And although he does have some strong positions on HUDs in general, and or sorry, um, tools in general, he makes some great points to back them up. I think you guys are going to enjoy that. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into my talk with Olivier. What's up, guys? Doug Polk here, and welcome to today's podcast on cheating in poker, defining the line. And I want to introduce our guest for today's podcast. We are joined by pro poker player, chess enthusiast, heads up, sit and go legend, and host of the podcast, Two Lives with Olivier. Olivier Bousquet, thank you for joining us today, man. What's up, Doug? How are you? I'm good. I'm good. So um, I want to jump in and talk about uh, cheating in poker and kind of just talk I want to, I want to get an idea of where that line is I want to talk about how it shifted over time and I really want to kind of drive towards the the question of of or really the the point of the whole conversation which is this underlying ex existential threat to online poker which is RTA destroying the games and I think that that's sort of the the um, overwhelming um, the most important point of online poker is that threat and how we're going to combat that and and where the line where the line is around that. But before we jump into that, I just want to say, uh, I'm sorry if I overreacted the other day uh, when you tweeted and I, I don't have to get the tweet out and read it, but it was basically that, you know, not using pre or having pre charts for my challenge with Negranu was, uh, I want to say profoundly lazy if I can recall <laughs> the exact words. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, let me just begin by saying that that was the, definitely the wrong word to use. I, that, my, that was my bad. I, I don't think, it, I, I don't know what the word is. Uh, I do think from from like my point of view, if if you you if you take away preflop as a decision point, you're you're doing something like you're changing the nature of the game to some extent. Whether you're making it more or less complicated, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe more complicated in terms of what you're allowed to what, what you can spend your time studying. Um, but yeah, that was my bad. I should not have said lazy. That's a stupid word to use. Um, I know you actually worked super hard and 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 crushed deservedly. Um, but you know, I, I think part of the reason I, I and I want to get into this also because I'm sure we're going to talk about a lot of stuff. But the, the only reason that I actually brought up your challenge with Negranu was because it was an incredibly high-profile match, and there was this converse. Like I, I had begun talking about preflop charts, generally speaking, and then this was a high-profile match in which preflop charts were discussed and were used, and I, I. I I didn't participate in the conversation at the time, both because I thought it was just not really my business and I didn't, I, I wasn't connecting it to this broader conversation about RTA and cheating because I didn't, I didn't even think that people were using charts in their, in their like normal games. Um, but I didn't think that there was a kind of full-throated conversation about preflop charts in general. And, I, and I, I guess I didn't think there needed to be and about whether they were constitute cheating and and where the line is and, and i guess all the stuff we're going to talk about now but that was the only reason i even like you know brought that up in the first place right well for, for the challenge it was it was kind of weird because we, we didn't have a standard negotiating process normally you talk with your opponent and you guys work out the details but because we agreed to do it before any details there was some you know, real questions on how do you study? How do I prepare for something where there's no specifics yet? And mm -hmm. I think that's why it was such a hotly contested debate when it did happen, because I had been preparing in a way that assumed we were going to be able to use them. And I, and he, I mean, he wouldn't even respond to me during it. So there was no, uh, I had to make a decision at base camp, Doug, are we going to study using pre charts or are we not? And I decided to study using them. And then he just came out and said, we're not using them. What, what was um, the decision to start to use them? What was that based on? Well, it was based on in the past heads up, uh, sorry, pre flop charts have. Uh, let me actually take a step back here. Sure, sure, sure. When I started playing poker way back in 07 or whatever the year was, pre flop charts were viewed very different. And I think a big part of it was because we didn't have solutions that we have today. So, there, how, how strong that could be was 
um, a much lower level, right? If you had pre-op charts, it was probably something you made up or you thought. So having these charts was less of a threat to just make these games unbeatable because your, your ranges probably sucked. And, and I think people didn't really care that much. Also, uh, just from my personal experience, and I'm, I'm gonna, I, I will have already talked a bit about this in my monologue at the start of the pod for a bit, but basically in my personal experience, I had always been in an environment where they were okay. The terms of service said that they were okay. Other people said that they were okay. It was standard that you had them. I, I came up in an era where it, it wasn't even, there, there was no debate. It wasn't, they were the chart people and the not chart people. All of the people that I was closely associated with or knew from poker or knew that were good um, thought that they were fine. That was the, the standard. Can we just clarify what is meant by preflop charts? Like, are, are, you, are you saying that, like, cause I mean, we, I came up, like you came up at a time where I was already playing. Like I've been playing for a long time. I, 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 don't, I didn't even realize this was a thing. I didn't, I never even so, contemplated using preflop charts in my life. Now I, I'm doing, I was doing, I wasn't really playing cash games very much and definitely not at a high stakes or at a super high competitive level like you were. Um, but like, even in the games I was playing, I never, I never used them. Uh, but, but just to be clear, like, are you saying that like, let's say you're playing an MTT like you can have like the the four bet chart when like 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 but like uh hijack opens cutoff calls button three bets and you're in the small blind and you're like 80 blinds deep you can like have a chart that says what your response to that action is well i i never did that for tournaments because uh i never really played that many tournaments and and well sure but i'm saying is your and they sense were that and they that... were also they were so easy man like do you really need... <laughs> no, i'm just kidding I, I kid the tournament players but but i guess I guess I, I always assumed that people were doing that and that it was okay. That was my my understanding. Wow. Um, okay. I, I didn't do to that degree, but it, some of these tournament regs, I mean, just to cut the bullshit for a second, you know a lot of them are doing it. Just, just Oh, I, oh I, I, absolutely. And, and that, that kind of brings up a, a broader question that, 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 you know, if everyone's doing it, is it okay? No, but what do you do if everyone's doing it? So I think that there, there, are, there are questions that, that's, that's a great question too, but... I didn't think that it was a, a problem, at least at that point. Um, and I think most specifically, the sites didn't even really, uh, didn't, didn't really either. The, the TOS on most of these sites was extremely lax. And I posted one from, I think it was 2015, a post mm -hmm. from Poker Stars Steve, which by the way, by 2015, I'd played most of my career. I've not played online. Right, no, I know, yeah. Yeah, yeah so no, that's, that's totally. So from that era, and it was, you know, we're gonna change it from pre charts are okay to these kinds of pre charts are okay. And, and there's been a real transition over the last five, six years towards trying to, to, to stomp this out. But I feel when you tweeted and you said that if you use charts, you are a cheater. I, I forgot the exact language you used, but it was very I, strongly worded. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't say, I, I didn't say anything about charts. What I said was that like, that there's, there are four betting streets in poker. And if you are using an external aid to, to take away my, my, I don't think I said this exact language, but to take away the decision-making process from one of those streets, you're, you're cheating. Well, it, that's a pre -pop chart then, no? I mean, that's the same thing. I guess one thing I didn't fully realize, and even now, to, even more to this extent from this conversation, is what I think is a reasonable lack of clarity and transparency from the sites themselves. Um, and like my view on 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 this particular example, but I think this is one example of other examples in which there are, there's lack of transparency, is that part of the, the reason there's a lack of transparency is because there is an incentive from the professional community because the professional community profits off of that lack of transparency. And I think that is a real problem and that is something worth calling out, right? Like I, I, from my point of view, like if you're a recreational player and you're just like playing for, you know, you, you play for money, but you, it's not like, it, you know, you're, you're, it's not your main job and it's not your main thing. From an intuitive, commonsensical point of view, I think this seems very clearly like cheating. You could never do this in a live context, and I, I think it, you know. Again, if we're if we make this distinction between, let's say, unopened pots, RFI charts, the very, very, very first decision in which, okay, I don't, I don't, I don't see this exception, but I've seen the sites make this exception. I've seen other people uh, cite this exception, probably based on the sites making this exception. But if we start to talk about more sophisticated, like raise call three bet all in what do i call with <laughs> like like that's a that's a real decision and like you're there's real edge in knowing which hands to play in which spots like obviously and so i, I just think 
the, 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 the part of the entire poker ecosystem that is able to best take advantage of this lack of transparency is the professional community. And I just think like a, a, a weird, I think maybe somewhat weird, but I think somewhat relevant comparison or analogy is just like live tournament earnings. Like why are, when you look up someone's name, why do you only see their live tournament earnings? You don't see profits, you don't see ROI, you don't see anything else but live earnings. Every time I've ever brought this up, somebody says something like, well, that's best good for us. You know, this, this is a good thing. The, you know, people who lose money, it's, it's hidden and it makes people think that we make, that the poker community makes more money than it does. And it's like, yeah, that's why it's bad because there's a well, lack of transparency because we're not, we're, we're essentially like deceiving people and then we're, we're benefiting from that deception. So that it, for, for me, it's the lack of transparency com, like paired with the professional community profiting off that lack of transparency that I have an issue with. The second thing there, the Hendon mob results, I've had this argument with a lot of people and I felt the same as you. And I had this debate with a lot of people that said the same thing, but then someone else had a really good point that made me realize that I, that it kind of has to be like this, which is who are these people they're going to track who bought in for what? No, logistically that's true. Yeah, I, it, so it, I, I don't know how easy or difficult that that system would be. I, I'm not convinced that it would be impossible, but no, I, I agree logistically. I just mean in that conversation, Sure. If your resp- if the lo- if the logical response is logistical, okay, fine. That's that's a different question. But if the logical response is, hey, don't don't mess with this. We're this is good for us. Like this is good for the game, or we're profiting off of this. Is that that's the 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 arguments? You know, the 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 structure, the argument that I take issue with. So so, okay. So just so putting logistics to the side for a moment. Um, the problem is that it's deceiving people into thinking that more money is being made here. And you think that, that you think that that's that's not right, basically. Correct. Yeah, I think you're 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 like inflating the the people. Like you're inflating like you're creating an impression that people are making more money than they are, um, and and you're 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 deceiving people about what's really going on, what the real poker experience is like, what real tournament players' profitabilities are, and 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 the, all, all this stuff. You're creating like you're 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 masking the reality, and 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 every time I've ever heard anyone. Or not anyone, but oftentimes when this is brought up, I hear the response of that mask, that that gap between the impression and the reality. That's a, that's a gap in which we benefit from. That's well, good for us. Well, it's weird with poker because there's this this shroud, this fog of war, which is luck, and sure. what 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 a what a strong factor in poker it is compared to something like chess, where in chess, if you're a lot better than someone, you just win every time, right? Um, except for you versus me on this trip down to Cabo, in which case, you know, I, I t- knew t- that was going to come up. <laughs> I knew it. I, t- I thought I was going to bring it up, but I knew it was going to come up. Well, I mean, point. you're just way better than me, so it's not really. No, no. But, I mean, a- yeah. a- anyway, the point oh, is. The, <laughs> the, the, the point is um, luck shrouds, shrouds that and it makes it so that people will gamble a lot uh, on the game. And so there is there is a benefit to, to I, I mean, Dishonesty is a strong word to say, to, to say, but maybe it even just is dishonesty in poker because it makes people disillusioned with what, how well they might do and how good that they are. You know, when someone wins a tournament, should we not, should we not call them the winner? Should we not show them with money? Should we not say that? Should, should we should we try and protect people from what? No, that guy's not good. He's not going to be able to consistently do that. How much of a responsibility do we have to? to be, to make people realistic. Isn't that, isn't that onus a little bit on the individual themselves and not our job to try and police who should be essentially what information is fair or not fair? Well, I think, I I just, I think that analogy is, is tough because, I mean, obviously I agree that part of the edge comes from people mis evaluating themselves. And there's a, there's a whole ton of psychological dynamics that are going on there and luck is a huge part of it obviously and that's part of the the engine that makes poker go and it's why it's profitable I, I completely of course agree with you but I think it's very different from how the community chooses to present itself and I think like like this for example like if you are an outsider and you don't you don't understand this topic that we're talking about about preflop charts and then someone explains it to you I think, like I said before, if you're an amateur player and you're, you're, you, play, you play a little bit, but not that much, I think the, the intuitive viewpoint is that like, if someone is looking at a chart that tells them what hands to 
call a four bet with in this particular situation, like that's unfair. Like that just seems so obviously unfair. And so if there is a lack of clarity around whether it's, whether that's legit, whether it's cheating, whether it's allowed, and if different sites have different rules about that, like that entire lack of clarity, I think adds to a general negative stigma that the game has, right? So it's like, I'm also interested in trying to not rehabilitate, but just to like improve the general perception that people have of the game to, to I, I think there's a ton of stigma. I think like, for example, one of the things that I thought about when we went to Mexico was that like, you know, there were some well-known streamers with us and I started to learn a little bit more about the streaming industry. And like, you know, some, some streamers, they make a lot of money off of sponsorships, right? And obviously part of that is because they attract a ton of viewers. But I, I think it's clear that poker struggles with corporate sponsorship and branding in part because of a broader societal stigma of gambling and some shadiness and some potential unethical behavior that's going on, potential cheating. It's just like it exists in this sphere that people are a little skeptical of, fundamentally misunderstand. And, you know, because like in all my interactions with people who aren't poker players, they completely misunderstand poker. I'm sure this is true of you too. People like, even people who think they understand what it, what the game is about, what a professional life really, really means and what it's about, what skills are required. It's just very, very misunderstood. And so I, I think accuracy and honesty for its own sake is valuable. But then on top of that, there are material benefits for growing the game, for improving the reputation of the game that accrue from being more honest and more transparent about what's actually going on. And, and, and on top of that, I think the community itself does a really, really poor job of policing bad behavior and of holding people accountable when they egregiously violate I think uh, ethical standards. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think someone should start a YouTube channel where they out scammers and 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 do videos about what. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> done plenty of that around here. Uh, no, but anyway, the, the point. So going back to your point here about corporate sponsorship, I mean, I kind of agree with the premise a little, but I think it's a really small factor compared to the main factor, which is simply that you look at the streamers in the other, these other areas. They're just way bigger industries, and I don't sure. think I don't think that the problem is that poker is looked in a negative light. I think that there is some of that, but when I think about the heyday for full tilt stars, ultimate bet, those guys were just blasting ads everywhere. They were in on all, all kinds of events. And I don't think that they really had a terrible stigma then. I think that the, the, the problem is when you make poker illegal, essentially nationwide. And then now we have this period of time where you can't basically buy ads for Americans. For, because there's no products for them as a, as a nation to purchase. And you combine that with this real death of the younger generation of poker players, which is, I think, I remember when I was a kid, and I, don't, I, I imagine it was similar for you when you were coming up college age, early 20s, whatever, there was a lot of guys that you knew that just played poker at, at, at school, at, at people you knew, friends. Poker yeah, was, yeah, a, yeah. was a common activity. That's just, from my experience talking with younger people, younger kids now, that's not a thing anymore. There's not those games. There's not that it's just not a part of the culture anymore. And I think that Black Friday played a pretty large role in that. And Huge. That, yeah. Huge. No, I, I, I agree. I think you're right. It's a more dominant factor. Um, but I, and I think in addition to Black Friday and the entire legal framework, patchwork um, of regulation that we have now, it's also just tougher, right? I mean, it's just much tougher. Like if you're a smart person that has a little bit of experience playing poker, but you don't really know high level strategy and you try to, sit in a two, five game, like you're going to get massacred. You're just going to get, I mean, I, I live in New Jersey. I play in some pretty soft cash games. Th those, people get those people get massacred. You know, they still <laughs> get massacred. Yeah. And, and like, and, and I think another, this is, but this is another, I think somewhat related point that I'm making, which is that like, there are a bunch of, like, for example, a lot of people in my mentions uh, on Twitter about this topic mentioned HUDs. Right. And I think it's one, one really clear distinction between HUDs and let's say these preflop charts are is, is the clarity around what is allowed and what is not as allowed. Like I live in New Jersey. There's three main sites in New Jersey, WSOP, Party and Stars. WSOP, because there's their license in Nevada, they don't allow HUDs. There's no hand history saving. There's just no HUDs. And it was very clear on the other two sites. You can use a HUD. And on, on that one, you just can't. That's just that's it's very, very clear. And so using HUDs is not cheating because it's allowed, right? But I don't think people should be allowed to use HUDs. I don't think that's a good choice because it increases the edge that professionals have. And I don't think 
And it also allows professionals to play even more tables than they would otherwise be able to play. I don't think that's good. It's good for professionals, but it's not good for the sustainability of the ecosystem. And it's not good for kind of artificially increasing the edge that pros have over recreational I, players. I do think though that your, your stance you're coming from on a lot of these things, and I think it's a good ethical stance, but I think you're placing too much of the, of the onus on the pros who, by the way, don't own these businesses, don't decide the rules, don't have any say in it, don't determine the terms of service, don't have anything to do with the legal system. These are just people that are trying to make a career and have re no effectively real power when that responsibility should be on either legislators or on the companies themselves. Realistically, the companies themselves should be doing this. Frankly, they should want to do this. And why are you putting so much responsibility on those players? Well, well, it, I think it depends on, on on which question, right? So, in terms of HUD, I'm not I'm not telling professionals they shouldn't use a HUD. I, I use a HUD. I'm not saying it's cheating to use a HUD. It's not. And like you I heard say. it here first, guys, on the Doug Polk podcast. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but but, but, this, but this is my point. This is my, my point is that there's a there's a distinction here between HUDs and and these charts in in, in part based on, on on transparency. So so because HUDs are very clearly allowed. Like I, I, again, I'm not, I would never say to a pro like you shouldn't use a HUD, it's unfair. Like, no, I mean, of, of course you're gonna use a HUD. And like I said, I use HUD. I don't think I use it very well, but at least I use it. Um, but, but, but to answer your question more directly, um, I think, and so th th this relates also to this, like, I would say more of a gripe I have in, in the, the competitive environment in which I'm in, in which I've, I've talked a little bit about this before, but it's like, you know, there's this, there's this whole slew of ways players can engage in the competitive environment, right? About buttoning opponents, about like sitting out when, a, when, a, when, a, when an amateur sits out, like all these little things that are like somewhat predatory and that have small influences on the nature of the competitive environment in which people compete. And, and, and my, my point is, I mean, this is a much, I think this is a much, this is a much stronger or like more dramatic issue because I do think this is actually cheating. Um, but my, my point is that the, the, there is onus on professional players. And this is, this is part of my issue when people bring up enforceability as like the, 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 the dominant factor of the only relevant factor here is that like, because enforceability is not always possible or perfect, that there is an additional onus on the professional community to set standards and norms. And that I think people underestimate the impact that respected pros have on general behavior. Like there's a very robust research on the 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 in, the, the behavior impact of example of the, the of when in, in any community or any industry like 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 prestigious and respected individuals have a significant impact based on their words and their actions and I think you know we can influence the nature of the competitive environments and people's behaviors on the margin right so like part of the issue is that some people say well hey if we can't enforce it there will always be some people who do this and. I think that's just that's just the way it is. Like that's true. That's the way it is. But we can create different levels of perception, different standards of of acceptance and um, and like behavior norms based on our attitudes, our actions, and the way we talk about them in public. And that I think will have a pretty significant impact actually on the margin, on people who are unsure, on people who want to view themselves as ethical actors, but also don't want to give up unnecessary edge. I think there's plenty, I think much more of those people within the professional community. And what they're really looking for is they're looking for a kind of some guidance. It's like, is this okay to do or not? I don't know. Why can't people just make it clear? Why can't people like you know clarify what we can do and what we can't yeah, do? But, because if it's not clear, I'm going to do whatever I can do. Like yeah, that's this, what I'm going to do. This goes back to, to the point you made 10 minutes ago where you said you, you're in New Jersey, you play on three online sites. They all have different rules. You're already getting to a point where now it's not clear. Let's say that, okay, so in your mind, if you allow HUD, that's fine. Um, but let's just say there's another rule. One says any pre-op charts are okay. One says only if it's unopened. One says you can't have any. And it's your take that none should be allowed, so I'm going to use none. Or do no, you say, no, 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 I, I, I wasn't... I, I was hypothetically, I, I okay. wasn't trying to make it out of this, that was your position. That was not okay, your okay. position. What okay. I'm saying is in this hypothetical example, let's say you make your position, none are okay. That should be the standard. So I'm not going to use any, then you're going to get clobbered by a bunch of the people that do. So really their lack of transparency that you're complaining about 
it, it doesn't really exist because these businesses are all individual entities making their own decisions as to what they think is acceptable or not acceptable and also what's the best for their them and their bottom line. And so there is no standardized actual response and rule set. And if there's no standardized, standardized rule set, how are we supposed to have transparency for the, the recreational players when it's different on every site? How can we as a community do anything about that realistically? But I... Well, okay. So, I mean, I, I acknowledge the lack of transparency is a, is a significant problem. And it's I, not I do the, too. I, I agree with and, you. And it's that. not the I, professional player's fault. It's, I agree. It's the, it's the people who are running the sites and it, it's, it's their responsibility and, and there should be some industry standards. But at the same time, like, like I've said a couple of times, like, I, I really think commonsensically, like, if you, like these, like, also it's like, when, when people talk about charts, I don't, I also don't think people are particularly clear about what they mean. Right. So like I use this example a couple of times on Twitter where it's like, you know, there's a program called, you know, Munker and Munker solver or Munker viewer is a way to, 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 to view all these different preflop nodes. And like, like, is that prohibited? Because I, I'm pretty sure that is prohibited and clearly prohibited. Okay. Well, what is one step down from that? Right. What if I create an app on my phone in which I can click a couple buttons and get to a bunch of different preflop nodes very quickly? Like I actually have that app on my phone. I actually created that using Evernote and like, I don't use it in game, but I use it to study. And it's like really helpful. And like, if I wanted to use it in game, I could, I could get a lot of preflop decisions like on the fly. And so like that just, again, that I don't use that because it seems so obvious to me that that's cheating. Now, uh, I, I guess I was, you know, I have to acknowledge I, I, I wasn't as aware that that sites had very, but I don't think actually sites, it, it seems still seems unclear to me like that sites have such varying uh, standards about what is okay. I think they're not particularly clear, but part of the reason they're not clear is I, I think, cause it's pretty, it should be pretty intuitive. Like you can't, is it, is, is it intuitive yeah. or not though? Because it seems I, it to me. So I, I'm, I'm probably not the best person here because uh, I've not really played online poker much in the last few years. So um, yeah. I, I don't know all the TOS and I, I don't know what the standards are, but. Right. I, I mean, he, I, I, did he, you he see my just, tweet? I posted a, a quote from the stars. I TOS. did. Yeah. But, but also that. the thing is, that's crazy. Is that like, that's not in the main TOS. That's like an addendum that you have to like look up if you want some further clarity. It's like, that's insane. It's like, and the, and the way that they phrase it is so straightforward, right? The way that they phrase it, I, I have it here. It's like uh, any tool or service with that, that reduces, sorry. Wait, what is and it? actually any, just, just for the listeners, we're talking about poker stars terms of service here. Yeah. Any tool or service that plays without human intervention or reduces the requirement of a human to make decisions. A human must decide what action to take in the exact relative size of any bet or raise. When it says exact relative size, you can preset bet buttons on stars that pick exact sizes. That almost seems that almost seems against these rules. The program is giving you a size. The program is picking 68% and putting a button for 68%. That's but not, you are the that's one not... that's deciding what action. But I, I think the point is, is there an external tool that is telling you what size to use? You, you are the one, like you're choosing this because it's an, because it's an option that you often choose, right? You can choose whatever, you make it whatever you want and you only pick it because you've decided to pick that size, right? So you're like, to you, it's almost automatic because you're just like, yeah, yeah, this flop texture, this range interaction, this is what I use. <laughs> but in general, like you're the one making the decision. You're not looking at an external tool that's telling you in this particular spot, pick 68%. Right. So this, that's what they're saying. This language is extremely strong. And over the, the years at STARS has been, increasingly aggressive because they've realized what people are doing and they've realized the degree of which they need to try and aggressively go after people. But that's, yeah, but that's part of my point, which is the reason this language hasn't been, I think, hasn't been so clearly articulated and explicitly detailed. It's because it's, 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 what do you mean? It's intuitive. Like what you think, not you personally, but like people think that like 74 big blinds, I should be able to know exactly what hands I call with when it goes open call, call three bet or whatever. It's like, no, that's part of the game. You have to study that. You have to learn that. Not every site is the same here. They're not in terms I mean, of how clearly and explicitly they prohibit this. Maybe there needs to be, and I don't think this will ever happen. And maybe it's a terrible either. idea, but maybe there needs to be a group of, of, of poker players or, or professionals or highly regarded people in the industry. I don't know what it would be. And they kind of set some standards for all poker sites to abide by. So that there was some clarity there. And maybe then by having a uniformity to it, you could have, members of this, the, the sites that are, that are going by this 
council's recommendations and then then it would be clear because i think the real problem is just how many sites there are and how different their rules are and then also trying to le- read the legal language read the legal language of it and i think i think part of the problem is 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 exactly related to the point you made originally which is that like part of the 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 difficulty from the site's point of view i assume is that like their their language and their rules have to keep up with the pace of technological progress <laughs> Right. And it's like, so like, you know, we haven't really gotten into this so too much, but like part of my issue with the enforceability argument is I think the enforceability argument, which is just to, just to uh, reiterate is that basically like if people have charts, let's say stuff they can print out or stuff on another screen, you can't track that they're using them. You can't enforce them against them using them. And so because you can't enforce it, they should allow it. Right. The reason, so that that's part of, that's an argument you hear and I've already said some stuff about why I don't like that argument. Another reason I don't like that argument is because I think it's it's only like, you know, some people have made the point that like the preflop decisions you make might not have that much of an influence on overall EV. Like they have some, but maybe not as much. And you as you get earlier in the preflop node, it's going to be less and less, right? So like, if you just look at, if you just like look at RFI charts and that's the only thing you you, you use, it's probably not gonna make that big of a difference unless you're just like a maniac and you wanna open every hand or something. But, but, um, but in general, I think that's just like a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an argument that only exists at like this particular moment in time, right? Well, in, in a few years, the, the RTA real-time assistance, right? Which is the, the ability of players to get essentially this, what I, I, cause I think this is, for me, this is preflop RTA. That's just, I'll tell it is. It's, it's, it's RTA is just the same, it could be the same term. It's real, it's assistance in real time. It's in game. What is the situation I'm in? What is the answer? What is my decision, right? That, that's what it is. And so, so it, when, once real time assistance on the flop or the turn and the river, once that technology gets better, once people are able to do it seamlessly, much quicker, uh, you're able to input or track from one computer to another, or you have something handheld that you can use, then the enforceability argument will apply there too. And, and by its logic, you're just like allowing people to use RTA because you can't enforce against it. And so I, I, I'm just, I'm trying to also preempt this like, I, this like argument structure from, from the time in which the technology would have progressed enough that we're just completely fucked because it, it's very difficult to enforce these things. And again, I don't think enforcement is impossible, right? Enforcement is difficult, but it's not impossible. And there's various ways that the sites can try to enforce a bunch of these different things. But I think as a community, it's important for us to set, and I agree with you, I think the committee would be a good idea. I also think it's unlikely, but I think it would be a good idea because it would be, it would be it's good to set standards and to, 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 to have norms and to, and to somewhat police behavior and to, and to make it clear to the, the professional and the amateur community, like what is acceptable and what's not, what is kosher, what isn't. Maybe, maybe there could be a, a, some kind of seal that if you see, you know, it's those are the rules and then right. you, there's immediate transparency there. Uh, and I agree with you. I, I don't see this happening, but you know, food for food for thought. Uh, as far as the uh, enforceability argument goes, I, I actually, I personally have not fully decided what I think is correct because there are some pretty clear counter examples of, of different things where, for example, let's say that there, let's say that it was really hard to detect someone that was able to steal money somehow. And so you say, okay, well then it's gotta be legal to steal money because we, we, we simply can't stop him. So it's all legal guys, it's all good. Well, no, you couldn't have that. You'd have to try and figure out ways to prevent this person from stealing that money uh, as an example. And then there are some things with enforceability where it, it, it does feel, it's so hard to enforce this and the, the, the damage it does is so small. You know, for example, maybe the jaywalking, right? Oh, we need to prevent people from walking the street when you're not supposed to cross the road. Is that something that's necessary? Probably not. I, and maybe that's a bad example too. But the point, the point that I'm making here is that there is, there is a middle ground where you have to say, just because it isn't that enforceable doesn't mean that we can allow it. There's not just a free reign. Anything that's not enforceable, we allow. But then on the other hand, if you have a bunch of rules you can't enforce, and, I, and I'd actually disagree with you. I think it's very difficult to enforce a lot of the RTA stuff uh, if it's done well by people. But that doesn't mean that you can't have this rule. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't strive to try and enforce these rules and to try and protect the game. So uh, I, I I think that it's an interesting topic and uh, I'm kind of unsure where, where I would land on that. I actually think it's really, really interesting that you bring up jaywalking because I think jaywalking is 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 an example that it, that that one of the points I'm making is, is quite relevant to. Like, I agree, obviously jaywalking is very, very difficult to enforce, but if, 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 any, if people have done some, a reasonable amount of traveling you know that the enforceability of jaywalking is 
it, it does vary a little bit from place to place, but the norms that people use in terms of whether they jaywalk varies dramatically. Like in certain aspects of New York, certain parts of New York City, everyone jaywalks at any chance they get. And you go to other cities, other countries, and other places, and there's some people just like, they just never, ever, ever, it doesn't, it doesn't even seem like they curse to them. They just like, they just wait for it to be, say, walk. There could be no cars even anywhere, and they just wait. And the reason, I think, is because of standards, norms. That This is just the behavior. People are fundamentally, for the most part, um, I don't know why I'm blanking on this word, but they're, they're well, they're conformist. And, and, and they, want, they want to see themselves as responsible, integrity-based members of the community. And so except, again, for, like, except for New Yorkers. No, but that's the thing. It's like New Yorkers, no, I know you're joking, but New Yorkers, that's the, that's the point a little bit. Because even in, I've noticed even in New York, it varies. It varies by neighborhood. There's some neighborhoods in which it, it does, people are just like running in front of the cars. They like run and like they, they, they'll, they'll be like, yo, chill. Why are you even coming close to me? Like I'm walking here, you know? And it's like, and then other places, it's much like people still jaywalk a little bit, but much less. And, I, and so I just think it's, it, it again speaks to the power of, of norms and standards and just like behavior and the way behavior is influenced by, um, by other people. And so if, if people are just generally speaking, if the professional community is like, hey man, you know, cause sometimes I, I get this like criticism of me, like generally speaking, it's a kind of like overarching self-righteous criticism. It's like, oh yeah, like, you, Olivier on his high horse telling everyone that they're cheaters and like, you know, this guy, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, you think I like being this person? I genuinely don't. Like, do I get some emotional satisfaction from like thinking I'm like, I'm superior to people? I mean, maybe a little bit, I don't know. I try not to, but like, ultimately, I, I really think it's the responsibility of the professional community to act and articulate certain principles, might not be enforceable and also might, might, incur a little bit of cost. Like sometimes I hear people being like, oh, I don't want to do that because I might be giving up some edge. That's like, okay, yeah, maybe a little bit. That's okay though. That's the point that we set some standards that like some minimum standards that we adhere to because we're not, because the it's not like the only thing we're ever concerned with is maximizing REV at every single decision point that we make. And I think sometimes that, that, that pe people just don't, either don't agree with that idea or they've just internalized that ethic. And so they're just like, anytime they engage with the decision, they're just like, how can I maximize my EV in this, at this point? And it's like, well, there are other considerations, I think. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. I know, I, I, I know the way you are, you agree. Yeah, the, I mean, there was, there's a, and there's a bunch of different examples there. As far as your takes go, when I see some of your tweets, <laughs> oh God, <laughs> I, I, I will say that you don't tweet that often. Anymore. And then, and then yeah. when you do anymore then, and then when you do, you often have a fairly strong stance <laughs> and then you and then you tend to use fairly aggressive language. No, that's and that's, then and then you're also you have to recognize who you are. Okay, you're a more intense person, right? <laughs> if I tweeted some of the stuff you tweeted, it would be less intense because I fuck around a lot and I joke. Around. But you you have a more intense demeanor, and frankly, you could probably beat the person up if they argue with you, right? <laughs> Online, and they have, they have though, to think about that. <laughs> that's the thing when people know me in real life, I'm actually a very silly person. Uh, but like, I, I I I agree with you. I don't I don't I'm not the best Twitterer. I'm not I'm just not I'm not the best tweeter. I don't I'm I'm not that good at it. And I also I struggle with um this like disingenuous behavior that people call shit posting trolling i i i i don't engage very well with it like i i think it makes me seem like a, like very uptight i'm not i just like i just I, I struggle with that type of behavior i don't it doesn't come naturally to me and sometimes i i misunderstand it so i, I seem overly serious and like and, and you're, you're right i just use some overly aggressive or strong or dramatic language sometimes it's a function of the platform itself right because i'm trying to condensed sure. stuff and it's like i'm trying to make a point but i can't i, I don't want to make it i don't want to use the notepad i don't want to make it in eight tweets and i, I lose some subtlety in I, I think i think you you typically make i think you typically have good posts you typically tweet things that are that are interesting to think about or you, you know you have interesting stances i i mean i think i think your, your your tweets are good but they just they just do they when you just have to realize that, provocative. That, that they are provocative <laughs> they, they're gonna I mean, there's a line in some rap song. It's like that's the that's the whole point or whatever. I forget what it is. But it's, I, I, it's I, provocative, I, man. <laughs> but yeah, no, you're right. It's that, that's the thing. I also like. I wish this is part of the reason I have my podcast in the first place, which is that like I just wish there was a better forum, and 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 I actually really appreciate like you like not not just like having this conversation, but like immediately. Like that's like that's one thing I I'm so I, I just can't do in my and I thought the point of my podcast in the same way yours is much more topical but it's like you're just like oh this is an interesting conversation let's have it right now let's put it out there and let's 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 create some nuance let's have a real conversation about it instead of some like stupid argument over Twitter so I I I think that's really good and I just wish 
there was a better platform for, for the community to engage because it would, I think it would be much less vitriolic and simplistic and silly and we could engage in much more uh, interesting and, and, and serious ways. It, it's difficult because the more complex you make a platform, the less people want to use it. So no, there's yeah, sure. there's these these trade-offs uh, both ways there. Okay, let's play a quick game, guys. It's time for a oh, quick game. We we're going to play a game called Fair and Square or Cheater There. And we're going to go through <laughs> a bunch of different questions here that I prepared for Olivier. He's going to tell us whether they're cheating or it is fair. Okay. Are I'm you going to tell me what you think after I say what I think? Uh, we can talk about that a bit. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Um, or we can rattle some of these off. Whatever you... Okay, so we're... I'm going to give you a couple layups here out of the gate, all right? Nice. Uh, oh, this is an interesting one. Using a phone, using your phone in your lap to see your opponent's cards in the hand. <laughs> Cheating. Okay, good. All right. We're off to a good start here. Uh, I'm not saying that would happen, but if someone did that. Okay. Sure, no, that, yeah, that seems, like, that seems like a like a good, easy one. Using a mouse to play poker on your PC. What is the other, what's the non-cheating option? Uh, fair and square. Fair and square. Fair, fair and square. Using okay, mouse, good. Fair. So we just, I just wanted to get us. Get wait, us wait, hold on. Do you mean a mouse like, like this is a mouse or do you mean yeah. like a bionic mouse that's telling you what to do every decision? Oh, this is going to take a while. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, okay. No, okay. Fair, All right, fair and square. Let's move on to the actual questions here. All right. Uh, using a mouse on a tablet app doesn't have a PC application, but you, you have some hook in and now you're using a mouse. Everyone else has to play with their fingers. You have a mouse. Cheating or not? Fair and square. Okay. Using a random. Well, hold on. I guess I guess the only like if it's prohibited by this is explicitly prohibited by the app, um, then then yeah then it, then it would be cheating. Okay, so it depends on the terms of service, basically. I guess yeah, but I think for the I think the default view that I would have is that that's fine. Okay. But that that kind of thing would need to be you know there's this question of like what is the default view what what needs to be explicit where's the burden of proof I think the burden of proof in this particular instance would be to to ban it rather than to allow it. Have have you played much on apps? A little bit. Okay. I mean exactly. I, enough to have I have a simulator on my computer and. Okay. All right. Oh, so a simulator is, is an app, but it's on a PC. It's a it's yeah it, it allows you to use apps on PCs. Okay. Gotcha. Interesting. I, I've I don't until until Cabo I had never played a hand on app I don't think. Really? That was my that was my first yeah my first yeah, go. You've been, you've been at the game. Yeah no I I, <laughs> I, I I Doug is not retired trust me. Okay <laughs> anyway uh, using a randomizer. The fair and square. Using a randomizer live. I yeah fair and square. Using a randomizer. Let me think of actually. Okay, so actually, I think this is probably good the way that we're going here. Um, do you think that it is assumed by recreational players that you should be able to that people are using randomizers? Because I've had this conversation with a bunch of different people, and this is a, this is a transparency conversation, I think, mm -hmm. which is as a pro, you you just take it for granted. But then when recreational mm -hmm. players find out about this, some of them are pretty unhappy. What do you think about that? I think. I would assume most of the time it comes down to a fundamental misunderstanding. I think it's the kind of thing that if you don't really get what it is, how people are using it and what's going on, it, it makes some sense to have a reflexive skepticism about the, the integrity of that type of action. And I think if people understand like exactly how people are using it, why they're using it in what context, then I think, again, I, I, then I think the, the, the natural point of view, the normal point of view it should be that it's completely fine. But well, wouldn't this go back to this tweet from PokerStars Terms of Service? Any tool or service that plays without human intervention or reduces the requirement of a human to make decisions, doesn't an RNG do that? Reduces the requirement. Yeah, I don't. I mean, that's an interesting question. I'm not sure I have such a clear view. I mean, it's hard because some of these nuanced questions I would prefer to have like some time to think about. I okay. would say, All right. no, no, I, no, I mean, I can, I'll try. I mean, I'll try sure. to, to respond to it. I think... Um, I think the, the, the point is, right, that like when you're using a randomizer, you have to come up with what the breakdown is. Like, so it, let, let's say you're using a randomizer in which three quarters of the time you call and one quarter of the time you fold. And then you like hit a button and a, and a number comes up, right? You have to decide that this is my frequency breakdown. So I think if you're using something that tells you what the frequency breakdown is, that is cheating. If you're the one that's saying, this is the frequency breakdown, this thing is just to helping me determine the, the, you know, like where I am in that, you know, in a random sample. Right. I think that to me seems, I mean, maybe I'm biased as a professional. I don't, that looks at 
he so I I, I, I I agree with you although I think I'm a little bit more uh, I think I'm a little more lenient than you overall I, I do agree with you but I I wouldn't be surprised if recreational players they see this and think what the fuck people are using programs to tell them how often something is that's cheating but no but that's but the, but they're not doing they're not the programs aren't telling them how I often know, something should be done I'm not saying telling them how often it should be done but they are telling them when they should do a thing they're telling you when to take an action so you figure out how often and then the program but, tells you when to take it but it doesn't actually because you you, you are the input that's the thing. You, you're the like you. You can also like. Let's say you're like call seventy five percent. It's it's funny because I I feel like this probably doesn't occur to you. But like let's say I'm like uh, I'm like okay call seventy five percent of the time fold, whatever. And it's like one to seventy five is my call. Seventy six to one hundred is my fold. And it become and it gets like a sixty eight. I don't have to do that. I don't have to call. I can still decide not to call. I can be like fuck the randomizer. I'm not calling. Right. I can always I can always do that. And I'm also the one that's coming with the breakdown. So it's like every choice is is me. I mean I. I, I, again, I, I think I think the, the biggest risk, I, I think some people might disagree. Like I, I get that. But I think the biggest risk is the, the the gap of understanding is that some people will actually interpret it the way you you you, you first said it. I know you didn't mean it that way, but the, the, the first way, which is like, wait, the thing is telling them what to do, like telling them what the breakdown is. I think that's a, the, that's the potential for misunderstanding that would lead to somebody to. But for the most part, yeah, I just I don't see. I guess it. I guess the thing is, Obviously, it's not telling you how often you should be doing it, but it does tell you when to do the thing that you came up with. Otherwise, you couldn't do it. And some of these are really real pinpoint frequencies. So it's super yeah. thought. It's super no, thought. You're right. You're, you're right. I'm just playing devil's advocate here. All right. No, no I mean, I, yeah, I don't. I, I mean, you're right. Next, fair, fair and square or cheater there. Using poker tracking software. Uh, like we talked about, I think if it's explicitly allowed uh, by the site, then it's absolutely f it's fair and square. It, it, but but uh, so I uh, actually a friend messaged me uh, personally about this thread and about this exact issue. And he was like, do you think that there are people using like regs using illegal HUDs on WSOP? And I mean, yeah, probably, you know, like there probably are. And that's a that's a real advantage that they have. And I think it's very clear to me that those people are cheating. Um, and, you know, it's just like, you know, the, the first step, I think, is there needs to be some clarity. And then that clarity, like, helps just, like, draw the line. You know, like, I, 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 I was just going to say, I mean, this is a little bit off topic, but I, I, I see a bit of a parallel between, in the early earlier days of poker, multi-accounting. Like I think multi-accounting was reasonably clear from a site's point of view that it was not allowed, but I think the community came together and created a much clearer consensus that we regarded this as cheating. So like, for example, I think if you VPN on your own name, the community doesn't really view that as cheating. If you VPN on another name, it does, right? There's, there's this deception quality where like people, you know, you know, other people, you have an informational asymmetry, blah, blah, blah. And I think there was a, seems to me in my recollection, in my sense that there was a, there, there was a clear transition where multi-accounting was by many seemed as just not thing you could do, but it wasn't as clear. And then it became much clearer. Like that is just outright cheating. You cannot do that. And that's unethical and you really shouldn't do that. And I just like, I, I think that, that, that speaks to clarity. And once the community was much more clear on that, I, my sense again is that people did it less. Yeah, I think that, that's true. I remember playing uh, high stakes uh, eight game versus someone back in the day. And before they played me, they said, hey, I, so the person messaged me and said, just want you know, this is me, but I'm playing on an account because I have to VPN and I just want you to know it before we played. And I have zero problem with the fact with that. I mean, oh wow! It, it, you're it, you're you're in a you're you're in a country that doesn't allow online poker, and you're going to play online poker, and and you're letting me know it's you. I mean, that seems that's that's totally fair. But now, what about the people he doesn't have the direct line to? What about the guys that sit and post, and now they're playing him? They don't. They're not going to. He's not going to know every person that he plays. Sure, I I I I agree that you're bringing up issues that like make it just complicated and difficult, and like you, I I you can I can even sympathize a little bit with the argument that like, well, some people fucking change their lives. They moved 
because they were unwilling to like break the terms and service in this way. And so like the fact that you could do it from home and that you haven't incurred any costs and that you're, you're, you're in this comfortable environment that that is in some ways an unfair advantage. Um, I, I mean, I think it's much more complicated and I, I struggle myself with this question. Um, but at the same time, I also think like what really matters like for, from my own personal point of view and like what, however significant that is, is like, you know, who cares? But like, from my point of view, what matters is that people are making a good faith effort to engage in their actions and in the community with integrity. And like the, the fact that this person messaged you to me is a clear sign. I mean, they're taking a risk, right? I mean, you yeah. now have this information that like, and you're playing against them. I mean, you're an opponent of them. Like, you know, like you could easily use that information against them. They are trusting you and risking something because they are specifically trying to engage with integrity in the, in, yeah. in the environment. And I think that's, that's great. I, I mean, I like, like I respect that. And, and I think that's really good, but I think that's, that, that is like, for me, the real clear indicator. And I think people, you know, people know, right. You, you, you know, whether you're trying to engage ethically or not, like you people, I think most people are, you know, they're trying to do their best. Um, and this is, I think, an example of someone like really making the effort. Well, what about the people that they're going to play where it's not it's not feasible for them to contact or reach out, or it just happens organically in games? Now what? Now now that person doesn't realize. Maybe they just that- have to be. Maybe they have to be careful and try not to play many people like this. And you know, maybe you know, may, maybe there are some people that they play that they can't reach out to, but they also don't think it matters because that person doesn't have any real history with them, like with the other account. So there's no real informational asymmetry. I mean, I, I, that's how, what, that's how I would approach it. If I was in that scenario, I'd be, I wouldn't, if, if I didn't feel comfortable, if I thought there was informational asymmetry and I couldn't correct for it, I would not play the person. Right. I don't, you know, but, and, and, and I think and this is actually a really interesting question, right? Because you can see, how many different and nuanced decisions people have to make in these, you know, so it's like some people are going to draw the line here. Some people are going to draw the line there. I don't, I'm not here to tell people exactly where to draw their lines. Again, I think the point for me is that people are making a good faith effort, right? That's, right. that's the difference. I, I will say, I see a lot of people, I was actually going to talk about VPNing. Um, that was up next. So we won't, won't ask you those questions okay. anymore, but uh, basically I, I've seen a lot of people complain about VPNing and I, I just, I just have no problem with it at all. This is just strictly a, a countries are banning you because they decided that what you're doing is illegal and you have to completely change your life now to be able to work. And I just, I have no, I have no, I harbor so, no, but, but do you, you, no you, so feelings you think, for those people. You think it like it's fair game for people to try to get into the games that I play in New Jersey. I think that it is. I mean, it's very difficult. Like the technology is really good. So like, I don't, th- I, I don't suggest people try because I don't think you're going to get, you're going to be successful. So but I, you, you think that's fair game for that's people That's an interesting question because I was thinking about it more from. Yeah. The into the bigger markets. Into the bigger markets. Restricted markets. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because it's like, I moved to New Jersey on purpose because right. it's a fenced in market. I mean, I'm lucky my family and friends, many of them are, are right across the water, but like I moved to this market because it's fenced in and therefore a lot of good players can't access it. That's interesting. That seems a lot more, I guess, I guess to try and put it a different way, VPNing to be able to play in the most accessible games in the world seems fine. You're just doing it because your country is being an asshole, but VPNing to get into niche markets that have very few people because they're fish there and you're bum hunting them feels over the line. Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah, it's a convenient point of view for me to have as I'm here in this niche market. <laughs> but yeah, that 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 feels that feels reasonable. I mean, again, I don't, you know, a lot of these comes up to individual decision making, but uh, I mean, that seems like a reasonable line to draw to me. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I I never thought about it from that perspective. I guess now that I think about it, WSOP in Vegas was pretty good. The few times I played it, there were some there were some reasonable reasonable games. Yeah, and WSOP is much tougher than the than than the, the fenced in New Jersey sites because there's a lot of pros that live in, in Nevada. Wow, hard to imagine much tougher than than that. I, WSOP has, I think, gotten a bit tougher. Okay, okay. Than, than it was like when you were doing the bankroll challenge. All right, a uh, couple more fair and squares here. Using a HUD, using a HUD. Isn't this the same as the tracking software one? We're gonna we're gonna it's gonna get more detailed. So we think that's fair. Yeah. Using a HUD when, when explicitly allowed. When it's explicitly allowed. Using a HUD that shows hands your opponent has played in the past. So they pop up when you hover over their name. That shows that you were not involved in? Let's say that you were involved in. 
man, I don't know. Is that, is that even a thing that HUDs do? I didn't even know. I don't, the thing is, there is a, so much stuff that HUDs do that I don't even know. Like I use Poker Tracker, I have no idea how to use it. I like, there's so much stuff that it can do that I don't use it for. Well, let's just say you, you hover over them and it's, it, it pops up. This is a hand that they played versus you that let's say is relevant to the line. So, so. Wait, no, I get what you're saying. I, I, I think again, my, my general view about HUDs is that they shouldn't be allowed. Like I, I, I think they're bad for the ecosystem. They create uh, additional unfair advantages for professionals over amateur players and experienced players. So I, in general, my view is that HUDs shouldn't be allowed. If HUDs are allowed, then they are allowed and that's it. And if the HUDs get better and more sophisticated and give even more advantages, then the sites need to constantly revisit what they are allowing. But if they are allowed, then they are allowed. What if the HUDs get really good and precise? For example, let's say that you had a HUD that it would show the value to bluff ratio in a given line in the part of the game tree you're in. And the HUD also maybe had recommendations for ways to counter it. I think, I, I think there's, you know, you have to look at the terms of service about, um, re recommendations seem clearly across the line. Um, but I, I think this is, all of these, I don't, I don't know enough about HUDs and about sure. how they've changed over time and about what is what the potential is. I think it's the onus is on the sites to maintain the integrity of the game. And if if HUDs, you know, it, some people have the view that they already challenge the integrity of the game. As they change, improve, if they can, if they start to creep up on whatever line the sites are using or the the the, the people agree on, as it starts to you know, push up against that line that they need, they constantly need to be revisited. Again, my view is that they shouldn't be allowed in general, but as they are allowed, um, you know, it, it sounds like what you're, you're, you're kind of pointing out a potential spectrum between HUD and RTA and that like, as HUDs get better, they start to, you know, border get RTA. into, yeah, exactly. Border into the RTA. Um, so, I mean, it does seem like the, the sites do have reasonably explicit language against RTA and against, how much it influences or how much it, it reduces the requirement for a human to make a decision. So, I mean, I, I, I acknowledge that there's some gray area here and I don't pretend to be the authority, but again, okay. I, I think the sites need to constantly revisit what is what the HUDs are doing, what's possible, game integrity. That, that, that needs to always be the maximal principle is defending game integrity. Agreed. Um, and okay, there's some different arguments about what that means exactly, but I, I think it's a conversation worth having and worth revisiting constantly. All right, last last subgenre here. Let's talk about notes. All right, is it fair and square to have notes that you've written on hands before the session? So let's say, for example, you have a note that's you, you do some database work. You notice that you're missing. You just don't seem to raise ten nine suited in late position. Okay, you're you're not a great player. <laughs> and so you write a note and it says in late position, raise 10, nine suited. Take that note into your session. Fair and square or cheater there? This is like a piece of paper that you have next to your computer or something? Digital notepad, piece of paper, whatever it is. You have a note that next time it fools you in late position, you're going to raise 10, nine suited. <clears throat> I mean, it sounds like a preflop chart to me. Sounds Cheater. like the beginning of a preflop chart to me. Get him out of there! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't, you know, I mean, that's an interesting, yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, this is, it's, it's, yeah, because it seems so innocuous, um, but it does. Do we um, report him to the local authorities before or after? When, the when, entire when... community shuns him. No one ever talks to that person again. I mean, you know, it's funny because I did mention that in the in Twitter and a, and a friend of mine was like, Messing me was like shunned by the community. Like I agree, these are bad. Like, are you serious? And then he was like, and then he was like, he was like, Sean Perry walks around like nothing's ever happened. And I was like, you know what? That's a fair point. Like that's a good point. That's a good. And point. I was like, maybe shunned by the community is a little strong, little little stronger language that I should have used. Um, and, and 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 but that doesn't also doesn't excuse. You know, it's like people need to like. I mean, come on, people. Like if people are outright like I had a I had a conversation with someone who was friends with Sean. And I've said to them, uh, do you think they stole money from Dan Coleman? And they were like, yeah, of course. And I was like, well, why are you friends with this person? And they're like, oh, he never did me wrong. And I was like, what? That's a lunatic. That's, that's but, a but lunatic. But it, it gets even more absurd. Whoever says that, that's a lunatic. It gets even more absurd. And because I go to them, I was like, would you ever? Then the person said, um, I mean, do you know Sean Perry? Like, do you know him? Like, of course he's going to do this. Like, I'm blaming Dan in this. And I was like, Jesus. And then I was like, well, do you think if it was you instead that Sean would have done it to you? And she was like, you know, they were like, yeah, of course. 
I was like, what? You think if you were in that position, he would steal from you and you're still friends with them. I'm like, why? They were, they were like, well, you, he's entertaining. He's fun. He's, you know, he's a good time or whatever. I just never put myself in situations in which he can exploit me. I was like, oh, how is that the base of your friendship? This is, people are crazy. That's, That's so crazy to me. It, it's bizarre. I actually have the opposite problem. When I'm in a room with someone <laughs> and, I, and I know they did something sketchy or scammy. You can't I, not mention it. I feel physically uncomfortable being there. Like yeah. me being here is saying that it was okay what you did. And I'm in some way supporting it. So I... I I don't know how people can stand to deal with that. And by the way, how brutal was it for that guy in that in that Twitter thread? Basically, every person who's ever met Sean Perry hates him, all of them. And he just had to read all of those responses. <laughs> you, you know what I'm talking about, right? No, I do. I do. I th- it's like, it, but at this, you know, it's funny because at the same time, like I, 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 I feel the same way you do, but I also I can't help myself but have some sympathy for him. It's like, like reading a thread in which everyone hates you. I mean, you just said it too, like it's got to suck for him. I mean, I, and I get that like he's earned this in, in a lot of ways, but it's like, if I was at a, I've been to tables with Sean before, before the situation. and like, I'm friendly with the guy. Like, you know, I'm, I'm friendly with the guy. Like he's a little bit annoying at the table, but like, I, I'm a chatty guy. I, I, I like people who at least somewhat engage. And it's like, I really don't want to be at the table with him now because I don't know how to behave. I don't, I don't know what to do. Like, I don't want to be friendly with him, but I'm a friendly guy. And like, if he's friendly with me, I just don't, I mean, yo, you stole money from my friend, go fuck yourself. I don't want to do that. But at the same time, it's like, I don't want to enable, encourage. I don't want to, I just, it you should, here's, what, here's what you do. You go on a podcast <laughs> and, <laughs> and you say, I don't like the guy. I'm not sure what to do. And then it just works itself out yeah. naturally. Yeah. All right. So with notes then, so going back to our 10, nine suited guy. So if a recreational player tries to learn and take a note and put, comes to the session and is trying to fix something like this. We're, we're not cool. That's against the rules. Because that seems, so. that seems, what, what do you really, think? Really? I, I, I feel like that's fucking kind of ridiculous. You think it's ridiculous like to, 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 to label that as cheating? To label that as cheating. Yeah. I think it's ridiculous. I mean, but what if, I think, what, I, what, I think, what, he, what if they have 10 nine suited and nine eight suited? <laughs> I, I, yeah. I personally, I, I think that's fine. Here's where I think the line, I actually view RT slightly different. I think RTA is in real time, a computer analyzing situation and giving you an output of what to do. I think that's RTA. I don't think RTA is, I had before the session list of hands I wanted to play in the cutoff. But, okay, get, but, hold, but hold on. I don't think play, that's RTA. Play in the cutoff. What does that mean? That means when it's folded to you in the cutoff, you open with them? Because what if it goes early position open, uh, like, you know, under the gun two calls and uh, the, the hijack three bets? Like, now you're in the cutoff. Is it, is it, can you have a chart for that? This is what I'm saying. It's like I, I, that that if you have if you're look if you have a really really detailed chart, right? Or it's like or like what if you have a whole set of folders, and you're like really good at just like picking the right chart. <laughs> you're just like here I'm, we go. I am so good with folders and charts. Like, <laughs> oh my god, people people want to know how I got to the top, guys. It was all folder work. It was like ex, <laughs> Excel Excel spreadsheets and folders. It's basically it. No, I I, I know they can get. Yeah, because then I—I I mean, I—I and by the way, I think we're on the same page here. Yeah, I, agree. I agree. We both don't want cheating. We want <laughs> transparency, and I'm not trying to, you know, protect people that are cheating in games. But what no, I'm but saying, I also what, understand what, the what, principle what, of starting at this reason, like very innocuous point, and then starting to expand from there. I mean, I get that totally. Right. Well, I mean, we're, I, I, you keep ruining these because oh, I'm sorry. I'm I, sorry. I, have, I have a simple one that I'm like, we'll all agree that's okay. And they're like, not okay. And I go, oh, well, because <laughs> well, I'm anticipating level two. I'm anticipating level <laughs> yeah. two. You know? You're not letting me even get into the. Into, well, wait, into, what was the next one after I said yes to 10 9 suited? Having a note to play 10 9 suited 100% in the blinds versus single raise. Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. the problem. Okay, um, sure. What's the next one? having a note to three about a specific opponent when you have 10 suited oh god <laughs> having a note to three about 10 suited 85 percent of the time where do we draw the line here and then the uh, last yeah. one was just having a pre-flop chart of the small line but anyways <laughs> the, 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 the point is uh i i don't know and i think maybe this ties in back to sort of what we were saying from the get-go though which is it's nice to have transparency but in a game that has so many subtleties and and such a wide array of things going on and, and, and a wide array of, of people's standards that have either, either been set in the past or are being set currently or are different in different sites or different, different locations or whatever it may be. 
I grew up in, a, in an era where it was fine to have prefab charts. I, I, I really, I don't say that now th- thinking that that's, it's not, it, it, it sounds so crazy to even say that, but when I was coming up, it was, oh, they're prefab charts. That's fine. You know, and I, I'm not saying that it should have been like that, but it wasn't against the terms of service and the people that I know use them. And at the higher levels, it was just standard for people to use these things to play. And so now I get here and everyone was doing it to my knowledge and it was fine within the rules. And now it's, we need to take a stand against these people. It's, I think it's, it's weird seeing this shift. And I understand that it's for the betterment of the game and it's to protect newer players. And I, I can see why having preflop charts is an advantage that someone shouldn't have in the middle of a, of a hand. But at the same time, if we get, this is really where I'm driving this whole point. If we get really aggressive on these super small line items, we take away from, we dilute the argument, which is the most important here, which is real-time assistance that tells people how to play hands in as they're happening will destroy poker. And if we get bogged- Online poker. O- online poker, sorry, online poker. And if we get too bogged down on preventing Steve from having his 10-9 suited open and late position note, and we aren't all in on preventing- um, Igor from cheating uh, in, in the six max games. Oh, very specific name. Well, I didn't mean him. You know what I mean? Like someone no, no. Eastern Euro- European Russian name. <laughs> I, 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 I should, have, should, should have come up with something else. Um, but the point is, if we get too bogged yeah, down there, we don't we don't allow ourselves to fully fight against the fight that needs to happen, which is the people that are that are really cheating, and uh, you that are cheating much more severely. Let's say. Yeah. No, it's funny because my view is the exact opposite of that, which is that like this is. This is like first down. Like I don't, I'm, I don't want to use a football analogy. <laughs> but like, Do you watch football? <laughs> no. Okay. I mean, I know how football works. Okay. But, but no. <laughs> but like, like this is the, like this is the first line of defense. And like we, we need to, be, we need to start here. Actually, we we need to set much stricter lines here in anticipation of the same arguments being used and creating a a, 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 a too lax standard and norm that people will like. Because I, I think ultimately, like like I said before, like the the standards we set are important and people will adjust their behavior at least on the margins in response to them. But it's like once you once you it's like kind of like the dam once you let the dam open it'll be very hard to close it and so it's like well it's like well what do you mean like real-time assistance it's like yeah if i can look at at my specific blind level what hands i can defend the big blind with to the cutoff open like that's that, to me that's that's exactly an example of what you described which is the what is the specific game situation that i'm in okay boom cutoff opens 45 big blinds now what should i do right and it's like once you allow that, why is it, how is it so different from like uh, uh, cutoff opens, big blind calls, uh, seven of hearts, six of diamonds, three of clubs. Can I lead? Can I lead here? Is this a leading board? You know, like, I don't know. Like, can I have a chart that tells me? Like, I just, it, it, for me, the, the, the leap seems pretty natural. It seems pretty so, seamless. And so I just want to, I, I just want to be like, no, 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 no assistance. There's no external assistance at all. That's not allowed. That's cheating. That, that's my view. So having a note that says these boards, I want to lead that's cheating. If you can reference it in game and look at the, uh, look, look at the board and be like, is what if this I got thing? a tattoo and it said lead on seven, six, three. <laughs> Am I cheating by existing? Seven, six, three comes out. I don't know. Seven, the fo- I, I, seven, I, I, six, three. But I, 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 will, but I, will, but I will also get, say, but I will also say this, right? This is, this is in part why, this is this is like a in in part the function of the legal system in general right is that like we have certain laws we have certain rules regulations and there's a little bit of lack of clarity and interpretive um flexibility and so like we have you know this is what precedent is about it's like okay well i don't really it's not really clear what the law is what it states how it relates to this particular example and so like people argue it out and then a, a judge or, or, or a set of, uh, of judges like decides and then that becomes precedent and that's how, you know, that, that's how it works. So it's like, just because you can come up with really, really, really difficult, precise, subtle examples in which uh, a, a somewhat, you know, like blanket rule struggles with, I think doesn't necessarily undermine the, the value of having a blanket rule. It, it just shows that there needs to be some you know, there, there's some gray area. People need to use their best judgment. People need to engage in good faith with 
with their decision making. And maybe there needs to be a, a, an additional level, an additional layer of which the support and the security of the sites or whatever can like also, you know, chime in on and clarify as, you know what I mean? It was like, maybe, maybe the tattoo thing is the like, okay, you need to call the TD and be like, hey, you know, I mean, if it's live or whatever, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, again, I don't, I, I don't think that I need to know the answer to every single subtle question for my like somewhat blanket rule to have like real value. Do you think that you scare off potential new players if you, you remember when we started to play poker, it was hard. It was confusing. It goes so fast. I remember the first was, time I, I played it live. Was, it was 2005. It, it wasn't hard. <laughs> but the first time I'm you old. ever sat down at a table. Okay. No, the no, first, no, I, I agree. Yeah. And, 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 but to answer and, your question, and then, honestly. And then they're trying to know if a straight beats a flush and you say, sorry, bro, no fucking cheating. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so I think, so, so again, that's, this clear, is, that's cheating, right? I mean, that's cheating. So, 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 so there was a, I forget what it was. We were in St. Kitts and playing a alpha eight, a uh, hundred K and thin, uh, thin, thin brag. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I, I bubbled in a painful fashion actually, but um, there was a, there was a, there was an instance where there was a, I think there were, there were a couple of amateurs, but one, one in particular, and he, he checked the nuts on the river at least once or twice. And like, no, no one said anything. You know, I mean, no one's going to say anything. And I think there are some examples in which someone is, you know, because I, I think intent also matters, right? So if like if you're if the intent is to create an unfair advantage, then like that needs to be dealt with. If if it's it's if it's you know, and, that, and that's why um, um, discretion is relevant, and that, that's why TDs are important to have good TDs and to use discretion, and 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 and, and that's why. Um, like there, there's, there's, there needs to be an additional layer on top of like rules. But in, in, in from my point of view, like I, I see what you're saying in terms of recreational players, like not like being like, oh, and I, oh my God, I, I, you know, like I, I, I don't want to be deemed a cheater or, I, you know, the, the, these rules are so strict or whatever. But in my view, it's, it's, it's I think the, the overall impact would be the opposite. I think you, you, when you have very, very clear and pretty strict rules, a recreational player will appreciate that because they, because I, I think, Again, when there is a lack of clarity and transparency, the most likely participants to exploit that are the experienced ones, are the professionals, are the ones that that understand the nuances and know they have the experience and know exactly where to put right. And this is it's interesting because I, I also I, I it seems somewhat related to this whole kind of general concept of angle shooting. Like what? Like I don't know how you define angle shooting, but to me, angle shooting is by definition not against the rules, right? If it was against the rules then an angle shot would be, I mean, I, I, I think there are some rules that specifically say angle shooting is against the rules, but like, it, it, like part of the idea is that if there's a rule explicitly forbidding a behavior, it's not an angle shot. It's just a, an egregious violation. It's a violation of a rule. And so what an angle shot ultimately is, is it's finding these loopholes, these, these ways that you can take advantage of lack of clarity and then like, you know, using them to create unfair advantages for yourself. And, and so, okay, maybe there's some large meta rule that says you can't do that. But in general, like th this is the kind of thing that I, that, that, that I analogize to, which is that like intent matters, uh, discretion matters. And like in general, more clarity and, you know, not across the board stricter rules, but it, you know, having more, you know, it's easier to be clear when it's, when it's more, you know, if, if you're like, no, you know, like, 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 like the rule where it says RFI is allowed but no other preflop decision you can have a chart for, but just unopened pot. Like that seems insane to me. Why would you open that door? Why would you allow that one decision point to have a chart and then none of the other ones? That you was just because, have a clear rule that says none. Well, we, okay. So upswing, we brokered a deal. We already had our RFA charts. We said stars, can you just hook us up? Just make sure those are still allowed. Cause I mean, we, we built our whole lead magnet around that. We need to get email signups, you know how it is. And they said, yeah, don't, yeah, yeah. don't worry, Doug, we're on great terms. You've never made fun of us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, We'll hook you right up. And, 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 and we just kind of got our members in there. So that, that's the background on that one, actually. Yeah, that makes sense. But yeah, so I, I, I actually think the there might be some pros and cons, but I think on on net that the, the impact of having these types of clear and strict rules <laughs> would make recreational players feel more comfortable, not less comfortable because they're, they're less likely to be exploited. I think actually... Let me actually let me go a different direction with this. Let's talk about the last two heads up challenges we saw. So the Landon Bill one, and then when I played Negreanu. Yep. Do you think preflop charts overall made the worst player closer to the better player or widened the gap? 
I think it depends. I, I think worse and better is are too vague of terms because I think that we're, we're talking about a bunch of different skills. So I think in theory, like you're a better poker player than Daniel, uh, but maybe Daniel is as good as you, or maybe the gap between him and you in memorization is smaller than the gap in other things. So if you remove some straightforward memorization from the entire equation, maybe that increases your edge. I, I don't know, maybe you're fucking awesome at memorizing, maybe you're much better than him, and maybe it decreases your edge because you're, the, the gap between your memorization skill set and his is even larger than the others. I don't know, I just think that's, that's well, you're, what you're doing is you're slightly changing the nature of the thing itself. You know, I, guess, you know, I guess I would look at it like this, right? Going back to your example, where basically there are four decision streets, you're, you're kind of removing one, right? Mm -hmm. you're, you're really focusing on three now. If you're the better player, that has to hurt you because now there's less opportunity for you to be superior to your opponent. So doesn't it hurt me? Didn't it hurt Landon? And doesn't it hurt the better player to allow these tools that make the, the playing field more level? I, 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 no, I don't, I, don't, I don't think so. I think it depends. I mean, I, I think also like if you are, for example... If you're talking about, and in both of these examples, we are talking about someone who is much more experienced, not just better, but much more experienced and someone who's trying to catch up, right? So if you, if you force the person to catch up, to, to spend a decent amount of time memorizing, then you don't allow them to learn as spend as much time, right? Because like you said, you only have a finite amount of time, right? So if you're like, hey, don't worry, we've, I've simplified the game because you don't need to, we don't need to worry about this first node. I've simplified the game. That might make it easier for them to catch up. Well, that's what you said, right? Well, that is what you said. It's hard. Oh, yeah, I, I guess it, it does yeah. depend. It depends on, I, I think it, maybe, maybe it does. I, I think it depends on, on how, what skill set we're talking about and what people are better and worse at. If I, I you know, go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. No, if you, had, if you had another point, go for it. Well, I was just going to say like, I, I also think just like, like I said before, you're just, you're somewhat changing the nature of the, of the, the challenge. You're just, you're changing it a little bit. And you're, if I, you're Good. Yeah. If I could have picked on day one charts or no charts, I would have, I would have been fine with no charts. It was just, I had to make a decision. How do I, but what, what you said, fine. Would you have picked no charts? I think, I think I better, I think it would be better with no charts. Yeah. Okay. Why? Well, he played great. Looking back on this now, he played great preflop. He played almost perfect preflop. I, I, right? I would ask you a, a ridiculous question. Okay. Were, please, were, were charts allowed in your challenge? I don't even know the answer. We're, to we're, tr we're trying to what? No, were charts allowed. Yeah, charts were allowed. Yeah. Okay, I didn't even know the answer. Yeah, we agreed. I'm like so confused. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So that, you were you that were had just... to that had to make it. Yes. Yeah, so here here was the deal with charts. We 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 basically we he was busy and and wouldn't respond to negotiations until yeah. later on. So it was unclear what the rules were going to be. So I had to start preparing for whatever, and I basically prepped with to, to play pre flop with charts. And then later on, he said no charts, and then I argued about it, and I said, you know what, fine. No I choice. mean, that, that also makes more sense then, to argue about then, it based on the fact that you prepared in this way. I mean, obviously. Sure. And then a week later, he said, actually, charts are okay. Yeah, because he was like, cool, I don't have to fucking learn this anymore. Right. And I think, <laughs> I think so it was unclear how well he was going to, you know, take these charts and, and, and play well with them. And I think some of the things his team just did were wrong. But overall, the vast majority of what he was doing was good and accurate. And most of his frequencies were either perfect or they were in the realm of, of, really close. of perfect. Yeah. 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 That had to be bad for me. That had to be bad for me. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't, uh, that makes sense. Well, I'm just giving you an example. I'm not even, no, makes sense. I mean, I, 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 mean, I, I, I agree. I, I see yeah. people making okay. pre-flop mistakes all the time. And like, I think like personally, like I'm pretty good. Like, and so this is another thing, right. Which is the, that I was thinking about, which is like part of like a small edge that I have is that like, I, I think I'm pretty good at taking like preflop ranges, like solved preflop ranges, and then reconstructing them in ways that capture the vast majority of the EV, but are much easier for me to implement and remember. And so like, if people can just look at the fucking chart, not only is my work doing that, like not relevant anymore, but actually I'm going to be less accurate than they are. Right. And, and cause the reality is, I think, I mean, you know, heads up is one thing and it's, it's a much narrower uh, game tree, but in general, like preflop is, it, there's a lot, there's a lot to it. There's a lot going on. It's like, it's not that, it's not like, you know, like again, RFI is like one thing. It's like very, very simple, but like there's all these different potential it, player interaction, stack sizes, uh, you, know, uh, you know, race sizes, a lot going on. And so like your ability to be accurate or to get close to accurate is like, that's important. I and I see people making mistakes constantly.
I just want to complain here for a moment because I said something on Twitter. One point two million is not enough. Is that what and I got and I got memed real hard and and I think it was unfair, Olivia. I think it was unfair what happened to me. You were treated unfairly I, on social I, media. I think I, I was. I think I was. Thing. I think I was treated that's unfairly. Tell me, and, tell me how. What and happened? worst of all, they made jokes about it. There were memes. <laughs> okay, so I tweeted and I said talking about pre-flop size. Well, what if I'm facing a 2.3 X or 2.45 X or 2.85 or 3 X, all these different ranges. And then there were so many responses making fun of that. And to be fair, they were at least pretty funny. funny. (laughs) funny. But at the same time, a lot of the, a lot of these responses, I'm looking at them. You guys clearly have no fucking idea how hard poker is. And the fact that you think that, a 2.85x open facing a three bet that's 4.15 into a 2.7x four bet. And that's obviously the same as a 2.3x open facing a 3.8x three bet into a 2.4x four bet. Those ranges are going to be very, very different in a lot of different ways. And they're going to have very different frequencies and you need to treat them differently. And you're thinking, fucking idiot, stop being lazy. Just know all of them. Bro, there's hundreds of fucking ranges here. I'm not just. But, I'm not just gonna know every single one of these but things. Is, but isn't that? I mean, uh, isn't that part of the point that because it's complicated and difficult, if you remove it, if you remove the 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 the, the, the difficulty from your own decision making, again, I I, I I use the word lazy. I think it's a bad word to use because obviously you worked incredibly hard, but like you are reducing the complexity of the thing itself. My argument isn't that it's not reducing the complexity because it is. My argument is that there is this sentiment that these things are easy and you're being dumb because it's just so easy. It's just preflop, bro. It's just preflop. And 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 there's a sentiment of I don't think you guys realize how specific complicated. Yeah. and complicated these yeah. ranges are and mm-hmm. their impact post flop when I'm running my sim is based around having the right preflop stuff. But so if I'm going to play a challenge where we don't have preflop charts and it's memorization. I'm going to spend a lot of my time memorizing prefop counters or prefop ranges, yeah. different sizes, yeah. all the stuff that but goes on there. Is, isn't the, the, the level of complexity involved in preflop, isn't that an argument for the external aids being more, a more clear example of cheating? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm not... I'm not dying on the preflop no, I know. chart sword. No, okay, no, I'm, I'm not. Yeah, I, yeah. I just, I just want to also make it clear. I used a lot of preflop charts throughout my career. Absolutely. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to. I'm not going to come but, out but here. Saying, go, but, but hey, like, everybody! You know, preflop charts are fucking cheaters. I hope you guys get all your money taken away. You're done. I never want to see your face again. I, I'm not going <laughs> to come out here and say that. Right, but, but, but at the same time, you made this point earlier. But it's, I think it's important to reiterate. The, the time period that you're talking about, the preflop charge you were using, like you fucking made up yourself. For the also part, true, or whatever. Yeah. No, Maybe yeah, you use were... some, you know, you yeah. use some fancy Excel also, math or something. But like, yeah. You know, by the way, it was really funny. Fancy. I mean, this is just a random, random aside. That's just gonna make me look like a moron. But like, like the first time I ever really got a poker lesson was like five years ago from your boy Ryan uh, from Fees. And like, one of the first questions he asked me, and he was like, "Yo, how do you decide when you play heads up? Like, what hands to defend from the big blind?" I was like, I don't know, bro. I just look at a chart or whatever. He's like, okay, yeah, but conceptually, how would you like make that decision? And I was like, bro, I don't know. And he was like, okay, let's start at the beginning. And he was oh, like, man. this is what pot odds are. Five he's like, this is ago? what equity is. No. He's like, this what I had. I didn't. He was like, this is. He's like, do you know what realizable equity is? I was like, no. What the fuck are you talking about? Like, he had to break down the most basic components of poker, like theory. And I was just like. I like remember recording this thing and being like, oh, this is good. Like, this is some good stuff. <laughs> like, I was like, he was like, yeah, there are certain factors that, that influence like, like re- equity realization. I was like, like what, bro? <laughs> he was just like, you're the biggest moron of all time. He was nice about it, actually. He might oh, surprise good. people, but he was actually really nice with me about it. I think he appreciated that I was just like, bro, I don't know anything. Teach me. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that was only five years ago. It was after I moved to New Jersey. I was like, well, I need to play cash games. I probably should learn a bit of theory. How did you play high six and ghost for so long without- Bro, without I'm a field this? player, dog. Whew. Whew. <laughs> Whew, that's a lot of years. <laughs> that was a lot of years, man. I, that's that's very surprising. That's intuition, man. I don't know. And without a HUD too. I know I never used a HUD before. It's kind of wild. I can't believe you sur- <laughs> you surprised in that ecosystem because there were Why, definitely- maybe. Oh boy. I dominated that ecosystem for a while until people like you were like, hey, maybe we should play some heads up Zingo. Well, I, I, I didn't do that great there. I, I forgot even. Well, you me. challenged the fucking best guy for a while for playing Iper. That was that was different. Yeah, I played I played Coleman some 30Ks. Remember that? 
Oh little, yeah, little, but little I, I, I was talking about um, VBV. Skywalker. Oh Skywalker. Oh, I played him too. Yeah, yeah. I got wrecked yeah. in that one. Well, VBV. I mean, VBV is still the top dog, isn't he? Oh, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't followed. I, th- I think so. Yeah, I don't think okay. there's a lot of action, but I I don't think anybody plays him. <laughs> so I think he's good. It was always tilting to play him because his hundred big or his starting stack was it seventy five bigs to start it was so bad. It was terrible. Uh, but then <laughs> I, I think the, it's good now. Yeah, I'm sure it's good now. But then yeah. the the blinds went up, and then and then obviously you're out of your element, and then this is another thing. Is like yeah. let, let, let's say let's say uh, in 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 let, let me ask you this question in the Cabo tournament, right? They picked hands, right? As as like blinds go up, that's a certain number of hands. Mm-hmm. Let's say instead they picked time, which mm-hmm. is a very standard choice to make, right? Mm-hmm. What do you think about? Let's say if I played you and I just took a really, really long time, I just maxed out every time decision every time to try to get the game to 30 big blinds. Well, it's it's certainly unethical. It's unethical. But I, I, I it's not cheating. That's so interesting. I didn't even but, know there was a difference. How could something be unethical and not be cheating? That's interesting. Well, you could do things. Uh, you could do things that... You can do things. I'm trying to think about like really a really good example here. Let's say that star. Let's say stars had a rule, and it was just a shit rule. Let's just say they had a rule on the site, and it was, um, and it was. Let me think about this. The rule was you could button you could button whoever you want. Buttoning well, I mean, is that is isn't that is that is a rule, isn't it? Can, everyone, everyone can just there's a rule against buttoning people. I think there is. Is that true? I think I that, can report these motherfuckers. You know what? <laughs> this was a really great podcast, Olivier. I said, let's talk about cheating in poker. Let's get two people on who have no clue no what idea. any of the rules what are. The, but, but, that's, but that's another point, right? That we are, like, if nobody, if we don't know the rules, it's, there's probably a problem with the rules. Fair, yeah. I would agree. Or, or, or certainly it's... Uh, I mean, it can't be a problem with us. <laughs> obviously, of course. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I think, I think we kind of hammered through, through most of the cheating stuff here. Um, I guess, I guess kind of, we're not going to out any cheaters, are we? I, I hope not. Actually, I hope we will. Olivier, who, who we got? Who's cheating? Oh, I don't have, I don't know. Who's I cheating? Don't know. Okay. It does feel sometimes like people are, are doing some suspicious shit against me. Can you give me an example? No, not like, not, not specific people, but there's a combination of bet sizing and like, and like people's decisions sometimes to play and not to play and timing and, um, there's some, I think there's sometimes some suspicious shit going on. Yeah. It's, it, it worries me, frankly, but it's tough know. on these sites that have less good security protocols compared to the ones that are very aggressive with it, because it's, it's just so much more likely that someone's cheating. Yeah. I mean, that's also part of the reason I moved to New Jersey was because I wanted to play on legal regulated sites. And I assumed, I think mostly correctly that those sites would just be much more robust about maintaining game integrity and that like unregulated sites, it's more of a, more of a crapshoot in that say. I mean, I, I, I'm, I, I might not be like right across the board, but I think on the margin, I assume that I'm right. Do you think that integrity is better in small markets? I would think it would be worse or in small regulated markets. I, th- I would think it would be worse than the sites that have to monitor it on a wider scale. I would say that STARS has much better safety or security RTA prevention than the average New Jersey regulated site. Or, but or- STARS is also regulated. Yeah, but sure. So you're, you're, you're if you're comparing regulated to other regulated sites, the larger market might be better. Okay, so I, really, I was comparing regulated to unregulated. Okay, but there aren't that many totally unregulated sites, right? Who, Man, who's un, who's unregulated? A- ACR. Okay, they still have a license somewhere, right? They just aren't. Oh, I, I, I've never played on ACR. I have no clue. I that's the reason I don't play on ACR. Fair. Or one of them. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I mean, what about like is ignition regulated? Uh, I imagine these companies have licenses. They're just not licenses that would hold up in the U.S. I, that, that's my understanding. Okay, but but on if we don't have the unregulated, regulated binary framework, if we just have a a spectrum from completely unregulated to like completely regulated, right? I would assume the further along you are on the spectrum, the the more robust game integrity is. I don't know if that's true. Wow, that's scary. I don't know if that's true. I don't yeah. think that. I don't think that when you get your license that the, 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 the board or whoever, the country, whoever is issuing you the license, I don't think that their main thing is, are the players cheating versus other players? I think the main thing are, the main thing is, is the site cheating against the players? Is the game truly random? Is it, 
Is it fair for the, I think that they're focused on those things. I don't think they're focused on our, our players using some kind of assistance to beat other players. I could be wrong though, but I don't, I, 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 I don't I, think yeah, that's I don't, the I don't focus. Know the answer to that. I may, yeah. You, you probably can do a podcast with like somebody. I mean, a lot of people know a lot better than I do. I don't know. That's not sure. That's interesting though. All right. Before we go here, do you want to tell people a little bit, a little bit about your podcast? Um, kind of, sure. you know, give, throw, throw you the plug here. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. I, I mean, I, I, I started my podcast in like, I think the first episode came out in the end of 2019. Um, I've only done seven episodes because I just have not been super motivated and quarantine was a unique time for me. Um, I just, I, I'm, it's not something I'm trying to monetize. Um, so I just don't, I, I, I think it's part of the reason I haven't felt as, 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 as much of a need to, uh, to put consistent uh, content out there. And then also I just like, I'm just very particular about uh, the conversations I have and, and, and what I think the value add is, because there's a lot of content out there and I do, I'm not doing it just for the sake of, of, of producing more content. Um, but it's like a meaningful project to me. Um, I, the, the first episode was, I was the person being interviewed and I, I was able to speak quite honestly about things that I haven't always engaged uh, super openly about with the community. And I, I also, I did that in part to just like try to be able to engage more authentically with the community and then also to try to set a tone for the future conversations I wanted to have with my guests in which I, I really wanted to be, you know, not necessarily like hit on vulnerability, but just like create an environment in which people felt comfortable to like talk openly about things that might not always talk about, or that might be more difficult to talk about and just like really get it at, at, at more serious, uh, sometimes personal content. Um, I think that's something that the poker community doesn't always, uh, I mean, there, there are plenty of examples of what people do, but I just think that's, that was a, a space that I thought there was a bit of room for. Um, and, and I also think that the, like I said, I think there's, there's some, there, there's some perception issues with the poker community and especially the, 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 the professional community, uh, in which like some, there, there are a bunch of people in the community that I think are really, really interesting and have really interesting stories to tell. Yeah. Your, your, your guest list, your, the, the list of people you've had on is, is amazing. Like these are some, some great, great guests. Like, um, you had, uh, Sam Grafton on most recently. That guy is hilarious. Yeah. Great dude. Yeah. Really interesting backstory too. I think a lot of people didn't under, didn't know, like knew Sam, but didn't like know as much of his history as, as, and that's another thing. It's like some people are more exposed and less to the community, like do more podcasts. They, they're, they're just more exposed. And so I, I tried to speak to some people, at least so far that have been yeah. not as, not as, uh, not as in the, the eye, the public well, eye, like Nick Shulman too. Yeah. He's so, so not in the public eye, you know? No, but I, he's in the public eye, but it's one thing to be doing commentary and another thing to talk about. True his own experiences in poker. And, and yeah, he's like another great dude. Then I, it looks like you had Dan Coleman on, on here as well. He's not someone that goes on many, many things. So that's true. Um, that's surprised, true. surprised he went on, went on even, I mean, you guys are tight. So I guess that makes some sense. Yeah. 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 That was, that was an easy, easy get. All right, cool. Well, thank you for joining us today, man. Appreciate the Yo, talk. Th bro. Th I appreciate having this conversation. I, 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 I really do. I, thanks for having me on. Hopefully we cleared up the, the air on some, some cheating. <laughs> All right, guys. So if you were thinking about it, now you know. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'll talk to you later. All right, bro. That's going to be it for me today, guys. Thank you for joining. We are going to be joined by Jason Les in a couple of weeks. We're going to talk about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, mining, environmental effects of Bitcoin. What are they really? Is the media over, over exaggerating its effect and a variety of other topics that are going on? Um, so that's going to be in a couple of weeks. Stay tuned. We have plenty more episodes coming in the near future. I'll see you soon.